This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster. And this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. Today we have a very special treat, which is we did an interview with Chris Fisher, who is a co-executive producer and producing director of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And it's quite the interview. Yeah, we're going to talk all about season two, a little bit about season three, a little bit about season one. Yeah, a little of this, a little of that. So uh, let's get right to it. So I want to welcome Chris Fisher, who is the producing director on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. We're excited to talk to you about Strange New Worlds. Oh, I can't wait. But I think before we even jump into that, let's let's be uh, topical and talk about the strikes for a moment. Would love to get your thoughts on what's going on with the actor strike, the writer strike, and the latest uh, offer. I guess you could put it in quotes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> from the AMPTP. This may be the, 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 a short conversation. I think what we've learned at this stage is that nobody knows uh, because I think we've all done, everyone that is an insider or knows someone you know that's an insider, we've all reached out to all our sources in this desperate and, and terrible time to, hey, what's really going on? What is really happening? And, and every time I make that call, I get an answer that completely doesn't pan out. Um, and I would, I, I, you know, my guess as a, to that reason is that there's not consensus at the top of the studios. I, I think Amazon doesn't agree with Paramount and Disney doesn't agree with Netflix and Apple doesn't agree with Warner Brothers. I don't think there's consensus with the, with the AMTP. Um, we know what we want. You know, I've been a proud WGA member since 2004 and DGA since 2005. Um, I was on the DGA, uh, part of the DGA uh, negotiating team. Uh, I, I was a pod leader for that. So I was in, involved with that. The DGA deal points, uh, I still feel were good. The writers have totally different issues and so do the actors. Uh, so it's not the same thing. And you know, I think DGA, WGA, and and SAG after are are one hundred percent unified right now. I don't think it's the same on the other side, um, and I think that's why there's so much chaos and and uncertainty. I don't think the new tech Hollywood wants to do business the same way that that the old studio Hollywood does, and it's no secret that those companies don't like each other. I'm confused this week that the you know there was a meeting. It sounded like there was progress. But then, it, you know, but then there's been press releases fired back and forth, and I can't tell whether the, there was actually progress or was or was this all grandstanding or, you know, so it's just it's hard to tell at this point, you know. Yeah. You know, do, do you have any insight into this? The, the latest offer for the aim was this all BS or was it a reasonable offer to at least show progress? I mean, I, I haven't actually looked at it in detail. Uh, I sort of, you know, took a look at. There's a couple of people, Amy Berg and David Slack, um, who are, are very involved on the WGA side, who are friends of mine, um, who I very much respect. I, I had kind of waited for their responses and, 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 you know, they thought it was, you know, what was grandstanding and, and bullshit for the most part. So, but I think, you know, the big issues, you know, are really at this point, you know, uh, performance-based residuals, um, like how are these shows really doing? And, I, I don't think they've had meaningful agreement on that yet. And uh, of course, AI, which so complex, we could spend a whole issue on that, you know, a whole podcast on that alone. But, um, you know, to me, it's strange because, you know, so far the courts and the Library of Congress have all come out uh, in support of humans and said that <laughs> AI art is not copyrightable. So to me, that's sort of the end of the story. Like they right. can't, if the studios can't copyright these an, an AI movie or an AI performance, or if something, so, some part of a, of a, of a, of a, an artwork is uncopyrightable, that, then they can't profit off it. That's sort of telling us guys that w this is not the way to go. You talked about the performance and all that. Were you guys surprised or not surprised to see, you know, we've been writing articles about how strange New world has been doing well at the Nielsen's ratings. You guys had no feedback whatsoever. You'd never heard anything from someone inside saying we're doing well. We're not doing well. You know, I'm an executive producer on the show, but 
as, as for you guys know, not, not all executive producers are creative. Right. The same. right. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, television is, is very much a showrunner run business. So our showrunners, Akiva and Henry, you know, they very well may be getting more privileged information than me. Um, I'm on the weekly shout outs, which are, you know, uh, I think executive producer only weekly shout outs from Paramount Press and stuff like that, letting us know, you know, all the all the great articles and stuff like that. They never have um, ratings on that. Uh, so, yeah, the ratings we get are from all these third party groups that but it's not that isn't coming from any official source. So that's frustrating, but we, uh, it seems like there's enough. And again, I usually get those, like someone will tweet it to me or text it to me. Like, Hey, did you see our show's number one? Or did you, you know, and I'll send it to Henry and Akiva. and like, do you see our show? You know, and it's, or, you know, but it, it's, um, it would be great to, it'd be great to, if that truly is the case, which I believe it is, it, it'd be great to really know that. And, and to, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're, if you're going to make a great show, it's, it's great to, to have that be official and be made public and, and, and use that to keep promoting the show. Um, that would be in the studio's favor. It's certainly how it used to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we used to brag about it, you know, right. and, 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 and when a show was a hit, you know, like, again, like going back to my days on person of interest being, you know, on that show, like when, when, when we were a top show, we use that to get the top directors and you get great, better actors. And, the, and the, you know, we'd ask, you know, and we wouldn't necessarily use it to go ask for more money. We, we would ask, you know, we'd use it to make the show better, to improve the art and to attract the best people. And, you know, everyone wanted to be on something that was, was doing great. I'm curious when you guys are shopping for directors, is it easy to track talent, uh, director talent? Oh yeah. 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 It's, <laughs> I mean, I, this is, I, I have the best job in the world. I mean, not just because my showrunners are, are are fantastic and 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 really support me on the director side and and what what my what my role and job is up in Toronto, but um, yeah, it's basically you know everyone's dying to do it, you know, and look and and we we do something very special here. We do something that hasn't happened on a Trek series before. We do ten Star Trek movies a year. And we hire 10 directors for those 10 Star Trek movies. I'm the executive producer. I could I could give myself more than one. Akiva could certainly direct one. You know, we don't because that's our – we have some we, – we think we found the magic sauce. And our magic sauce is we don't block episodes. We don't cross board. We don't, you know, we don't hire a roster of directors and say, hey, you know, you can come, come do this one. Or, or if you do something else, then I'll give you this one. Like that's how we lost Jonathan Frake season one because – we, you know, and, and again, like that was a, a, an emotional loss. I love that man, uh, but we lost him because when the episode that we hire you for, we start developing it with you. Like we, we do, we hire directors in a completely different way than on any show I've ever worked on. Different than any Trek show. The funny thing, or the fun thing, is that when I give this pitch to directors in the in my initial meeting with them. They've all heard this before from other shows. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but they don't believe me. Then the next, once they get hired, when we start sending them, you know, we're getting it very involved early on in, in, in our AR sets and our world building, which is our, is again, a, an, another part of our magic sauce to why the shows, I think, look so great, is we get, we start getting them involved in all this stuff early on, just like they're doing a movie. And they make choices through the entire process, like they're making a movie. They can do anything they want. Akiva and Henry have said to me, you know, that we've all been on, involved in TV shows where the person who has my job, the producing directing job, kind of can be more sometimes a, a uh, creative cop. And I think it was Akiva's exact words, which very much inspired me. And he's like, you know, Fish, you, you're their patron. You, you are the patron of these directors. You You are there to give them everything they possibly want. Let, let someone else, <laughs> you know, clip their wings, be their patron. And, and it's, again, it's, and I ran with it, of course, because, wow, what a, what a great way to, what, what a great job that sounded like. I want to do that. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's created a lot of problems for us again, because, because we don't rotate directors, we don't move episodes around and we've lost some good directors. Um, when schedules are changed and things have happened because we really feel like this is our, this is, this is our magic. This is what's different. This is why 
And 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 the word is spread around. You know, people in town know this. They they want to come direct our show. Everyone does. You said you do everything differently. How do you pair a director to an episode, which, uh, as you said, are each is you know, the whole point of the show, or not maybe the point, but yeah, the, the style of the show is everything's different. So you know, you you know, did you have a board up at the beginning of the year, and it's a like time travel crossover musical yep. and then you had a board of directors and you're like this guy's better for uh, you know because it seemed obvious the musical guy you got the guy who did the you know so how how's that whole process work of pairing directors to you 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 just stole my entire dna so that's exactly <laughs> it so uh we we have so and we can talk about this a little bit when we talk about the AR wall. You know, our show has to run differently for a lot of different reasons. And and, and most Star Trek shows do because, you know, uh, there's not many sets you can go to or props you can buy from a store or costumes you can go buy at a store that look like Star Trek. Everything's bespoke. Everything has to be made. Every detail, every stitch, every set, everything is bespoke on a show. So we have to get way ahead. This is not, you know, we, we, we need, we need our, we need our season break many, many months before we start production, uh, many months before we start even early prep. We have great showrunners who know that. So at the end of season one, and this was so awesome. And again, this, this kind of stuff that just doesn't happen on any other show at the end of season one, Akiva and Henry flew up to Toronto with all the writers they locked themselves. We gave them a, a room on, at, at the production offices, and they locked themselves in a room and basically like, we're not leaving until we broke in season two kind of for you guys. And they did it. And Frank Syracuse, uh, one of our executive producers, myself, you know, uh, Jonathan Lee, our, our production designer, Glenn Keenan, our DP, Bernadette Croft, our costume designer, you know, some key people. Uh, uh, Jason Zimmerman, our, our VFX producer, some key people also came to this meeting and they basically, here's the whole season. Here's what you guys are going to go do. So, you know, that, that, so that means we kind of, we never really got a true hiatus. We were like, so I immediately after that, I'm searching for directors. I'm putting, I'm putting out of the net. So here's, here's what we need. Here's our, here's what we have to find. You know, now you don't and, have, you don't have scripts here, no. but you have, we have, you, a, we, we have, we have a, uh, I don't know if we actually even had anything in writing for a while, but they basically just said it was, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. Like, here it is, you know. So they just here. Here's your here's our 10 genres. Here are our 10 worlds. Um, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, again, the the musical we started prepping before. And that was episode nine. You know, the, yeah, that we started prepping that before we even started prepping the premiere. That's how far ahead we had to get of stuff like that. So I guess the, the the good news of of just big budget Star Trek TV in general, and especially our show, which again episodes aren't easy to move and directors aren't easy to move, is that we do the, the showrunners know they have to start the story telling process early, uh, and, and 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 perhaps the biggest beneficiary of that is production, uh, which is my domain. Uh, I, I I don't. My executive producer um, VIP pass does not work for the writer's room, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, unless I'm delivering coffee. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> I, I, I don't get in that room. But getting those writers working early, getting the minds on it, getting you know, you know, Akiva and Henry, are, you know, really are big, big brain bugs. You know, just getting those guys, just you know, get Akiva in a room to concept a Star Trek show is like, you know, he's never been happier. I've never seen anyone happier than letting him use his his mind for something like that. Um, but yeah, but production is the big beneficiary and the directors are. So just for everyone listening, can you describe your role on the show? Like specifically in a nutshell, I'm in charge of directors, visual language and uh, everything production related in Toronto. I like yeah. that you're already saying Toronto like a native. I'm from Toronto, so oh. you're, you're saying it without that second T. So a plus for you. You've been there nice. a while. <laughs> it's my second. It's my second time living up there. My second show up there. Uh, it's the it's the best place in the world to make uh, film. Uh, it, it's such a c- cinephile city. It's crazy. If you, I, 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 my career began in the independent film world, and uh, it was always if you know 
you go to Sundance and half the people would walk out. You go to Telluride, you know, people would boo your movie. But you go to Toronto and you got a standing ovation. Like, oh, yeah. You know, it was like they <laughs> love cinema. You know, bring them anything. They'll eat it. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to work. We have a fantastic crew. But, yeah, so my job in a nutshell is to – I'm the – <clears throat> number two guy underneath the showrunners uh the showrunners stay wherever you know wherever the studios are wherever the writer's room is and wherever the edit edit room is so the studios if you know if your if your mothership here is the studio the studio wants to keep their writers and their editors nearby keep them close they want to control the process but they want to go make the show for the least amount of money they can so they want to go to a, a tax incentive place usually and I'm the person who goes. So the showrunners stay, oversee the writer's room, oversee editorial, and then I get sent to uh, wherever the show gets made. Yeah, and, and, you know, everything to do with the actors, everything to do with the directors, everything to do with set design, everything to do with the AR wall, which is my, you know, my my uh, my, my real, uh, the, the new love of my life. Um, <laughs> that's the stuff that I get to uh, handle. I'm curious when you, you know, cause you, you, we have these different styles and as you were saying, directors love it when you guys actually mean that they're allowed to express themselves in different ways. But like, are you like when you bring someone in and say, okay, this is, you know, this is going to be like episode eight was war movie. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you brought in Jeff Burt, yeah. right. Um, and I actually talked to him a little bit about this, but did you know, did, are, do you say like, here's an episode of Deep Space Nine we like, you know, and here's an here's a particular war movie we like? Or how do you give them a, you know, visual cue so that they know to make it different than you know another episode of Strange New Worlds? Well, certainly there are those references given to the director, one hundred percent. Um. You know, for 208 with Jeff Bird, uh, Davey Perez was uh, who's a, uh, also uh, uh, an executive producer and, and writer. Um, you know, he, you know, he had a very clear vision. It, it, the vision was clear in the script. It was a fabulous script. Um, so in one of the first meetings, if not the first meeting, will be your 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 concept meeting. And, and sort of that's when the, you know, the director would, would usually get that stuff. But again, our show, we know that stuff so much earlier on. So I'm kind of just feeding that stuff casually to the guest director throughout the season. So, you know, and often they're on different projects, but I, I just keep them up speed on everything. So they'll get those references so early that they'll be able to not just say, okay, I know you want that, but they'll be able to ingest it a little bit, spin it around a little bit, feel it out. Hey, how does that feel? Or actually, I want to do something different. You know, do you mind if I reach out to Henry and Kiva and, you know, do I have a different take on this? Can I do that? That that happens, too. Um, so that's the benefit, again, of having this stuff early. This isn't really a Star Trek thing. It's more, more my thing or, you know, personally. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, you know, cinema is, is the is, is a spiritual uh, guide of my life. Um but when I'm actually making my own thing, when I'm directing, you know, I, I try not to reference other works of cinema, uh, Star Trek or otherwise, which I, I try to I try to pull my influences, my inspiration out of the, the script and material itself. So I, again, I can only speak how I work. But you know, with Star Trek, obviously, is unique. You know, uh, the canon is is vast, and uh, the fans expect that connection and embrace of it. But we we never say it has to be like. You know, we, we, you, they never, like, you never get like the elevator pitch for an episode. Like this is, you know, DS9, this meets TOS, this, that, like they'll, they'll never get something that sort of basic and say to go off of. Unlike other shows I've been on, there's a lot of room for a director to, and a lot of time, you know, because time is always the enemy of directing a time for a director to, um, to spin the plates themselves, come up with their own take on it, um, and really pitch it. Can you think of a specific example, like an episode where a director really did shift something that was in the game plan? Yeah, I would say, um, I would say Dermot, the musical. Um, so H Henry and I did the magicians together for five years. 
Um, and one of the things about the magicians is uh, we made a musical uh, pretty much every season. Uh, I don't think the first, not the first two seasons, but season three, four, and five. So I had experience not only working with with Henry, uh, one of our showrunners, but but working on him with musicals. But we oh, we we never did original songs, and we never did, um, and we only did like you know three or four uh, songs per episode, They're much smaller in scale than this. So this was brand new for us, uh, for me, and I've never been exper- involved with something like this. Having 10 original songs, uh, 10 original recordings, dance, choreography, everything like that. And, you know, I, again, I, I will admit, in, in my mind, I, I, had a trouble, I had trouble sort of totally visualizing it. And, again, I, th- I think Akiva drove this, but really I had been p- throwing them some director names early on. And maybe they could see, you know, maybe or maybe they could hear my voice. Like when I was talking about, it, I'm like, what the fuck is Fish talking about? Like, <laughs> does, does he really know what he's talking about? Like, I, I didn't really, you know. I was like, you know, I, I'm not a musical guy. Like, I I don't know. So they're like, you really have to hire just someone who's done this. And and of course, as you guys know, Dermot has, had done an amazing job before. And so he came in and he really saw it and he really shaped it and he really changed it. And he got super involved in the choreography, the recordings, everything. We flew him up way early. He started his prep way early. He was going in and recording with the actors over the weekends, changing songs, giving notes, moving things. Same with the choreography, same with the dance. I mean, he really shaped and changed that that episode because, you know, I don't know why we were so insane to do that. Like, <laughs> the 208 was a giant episode. We that was a, a the, the, the the you know the Klingon battle was like that. We we had never used our AR wall like that before, so we were so overwhelmed with that episode. And then of course we had the finale that Maya directed, which you know that which again was so overwhelming to reconstruct this entire city. Like so, we were so completely overwhelmed and by these episodes book ending this musical. And then we had this giant. Music. So Dermot really had the chance to sort of shape it, and that's what he did. I, I would say that was that episode was as much his voice uh, as as anything else. Have you ever had to say no? Like, has a director ever gone too far, or tried to you know pitch something that just just wouldn't work in Star Trek? Like, it's too violent or it's too campy or that kind of stuff. Does that come up well, a lot? We did do Klingon K-pop, so <laughs> I guess I guess I guess if the campy, if I ever pulled out the campy wand, that would have been it. And not that we didn't have uh, a lot of discussions about that, and not that we also didn't shoot a backup version of that song we did. What What was the style of the backup version? Oh man, I think it's like opera or something. I think it was opera, oh, like Klingon opera or yeah, human Klingon opera. opera. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should release it. It should. It should. Maybe I. I. I can imagine that'll come out in the DVD extras. But yeah, we, there we were. We, there was enough cold feet. Uh, with Klingon K-pop that, um, that we got it. We, we did shoot a, uh, sh- recorded a song, everything back up version of that, you know? So, um, yeah, that's kind of funny. Well, uh, people loved it. So there you go. There you go. Um, as far as the no to other directors, I mean, so, I mean, I mean, certainly that's a part of my job. I, I, I don't, maybe it's selective memory that I, I, I don't remember. I mean, I don't, I, I haven't had a director experience where that, that was a, defining element of it by any means you know um i can't say that i've had to play director cop much at all on the show not that everything works not that everything works in my episodes and and again i'm not it's not a not a way around the question but i think also our scripts are very good um and they're very clear and you know there's not a lot of confusion as to what the genre is and what the emotive moments are um and you know, the only way a director really can fail on, on our show, other than, you know, being terrible, but uh, uh, but the only way you can fail on our show is to not put character first, is is to think you're doing a big action scene and not putting the character first, or think you're trying to make the joke really funny and not putting the character first. If you ever get ahead of character, if anything ever gets in front of character, um, that scene's not going to work. It's not going to work for our showrunners. It's not going to work for our fans. We all know great television. You know, you all know you like, when a when a great TV show it's on year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know it's a great show because all you're doing is watching this these characters that you love. 
You know what I mean? Everything, even though every, it's still everything might look great, you're just falling. And that was always sort of the goal here. Like, let's create these characters that people love, and we know they love them. That's the benefit of doing a, a prequel to TOS. Is like, you know, we have the we have you know 2020 is hindsight, and we're using that to our best advantage. Like, these are the best characters ever created for television, and we we get to we get to tell their backstory and introduce them. And so that's what it's about. It's always been so character driven. And, and look, I'll say, Hey, when did a director not do a great job myself, you know, on the premiere this year, I, you know, I, I was so in love with these action sequences with, with Babs and Jess and the Klingons that, you know, I think I probably overemphasized some of that stuff. You know, I'm not immune to uh, director hubris either. You know, sometimes you can get carried away with something. Um, but but our best episodes and 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 uh, or my favorite episodes are always the ones that are character driven and the directors who do the best jobs are the ones that always put the character first. This is a more technical question, but I mean there is a consistent, fairly consistent lighting on your show, and it, you know this is one of the most controversial things about Picard season three. I don't know if you watch that, but um, they brought in a new DP and they went for this cinematic style. What if a director wanted to go more cinematic, wanted to go darker? Like, or is that something you would say, nope, you know, we have our lighting style, stick with it? No, we do. I mean, we <clears throat> that question came up specifically in uh, 104 Memento Mori, uh, Memento Mori uh, by Dan, the director by Dan Liu, you know, and, you know, we went for it. You know, I, that was a very, you know, that was, a, you know, that's, you know, our, our metaphor for that was a sinking submarine, you know, and so that was, uh, you know, we we went as dark as we could with that. Look, you can't go that dark on our show because all our walls are white. You know, so <laughs> our production, so you you're in a white box, right? So, um, so you know, so a, a lot of you know lighting is one thing that appears in front of the camera, and of course, the other thing is the you know paint color and reflective material. You know, it's it's and there's only so much you can do to deal with a a, a shiny white cylinder. Um, so, so that very much informs our visual language, our palette, our color and stuff like that. But, but we, you know, we take, you know, and also in 109, you know, we tried to make it as, as, as dark as possible. Um, so, um, no, that, that, that stuff is embraced. For example, on 110, I used a whole different set of lenses. I, I wanted to, I, I didn't want to, we have these really beautiful lenses that don't have a lot of good, really good close focus. And I wanted to get really up, like, especially on the Romulan ship, I wanted to feel really claustrophobic. I wanted the lens right up in their faces. So we changed our whole lens package. So we, 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 we you can come in and you can say, I want to use a different camera, a different lens. I want to light this totally different. And we'd say yes. Given the the range of genres that you guys cover in a season, does the tone of the episode actually affect the mood on set when you're filming? Like some are comedies and some are really dark and gritty and then others are light. Does that does that affect the team, the actors? No, I mean, we don't really have any method kind of actors uh, or anything like that. Um, they're pretty congenial and and fun and kind all the time. Um they hate the the spacesuits. The spacesuits are uncomfortable and sweaty, and <laughs> and the helmets hurt, and the you know so uh, that can affect the mood on set. That's a Star Trek tradition is hating those things. Oh my god! Yeah. I, know, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know. And look, we inherited them from Disco. We had to refab them, and every season we refab them a little bit more to make them slightly less painful. But. um the genre doesn't affect the episode. The director's personality certainly does. You know, having someone like Jonathan Frakes or something like that come do our show is is sort of a, a lifeline to so much history and and joy. And you know, he kind of he kind of wears that. Uh, uh, he's a, just such a gentleman, but he you know he wears that really on his sleeve. And so I you know um, every episode is very going back to this is a show that we do 10 Star Trek movies. Every episode is very much the personality of the director. Was it nuts filming the crossover? <laughs> no, I mean, again, like, and look, and so when I, I mean, in a good hard, way, how hard 208 <laughs> was um, and how hard 209 was and how to, so the crossover was kind of like, Oh, you've got an easy one. And then of course it was not anything, but not anything, anything, but easy. Um, the animation took a long time and I, it was funny at, at early on, th there wasn't really the, 
the budget to do the credit sequence and animation. But I think once they saw the cut, they realized how good it was. And they're like, yeah, we get, we'll find that money somewhere. Because that credit sequence and animation was so dope. That was so great. Tawny and Jack were amazing. Um, the, the, our, our actors loved them. Um, uh, if you're shipping uh, Ethan and, and Jack, uh, like those two, <laughs> those guys are, I mean, that I've never, like, they were like best friends. And, and same with uh, Tawny and Celia. And it was like a, it was a total love affair. But again, like that's an episode, like, I mean, like, come on, like, if I hired anyone but Jonathan Frakes to do that episode, I, I you know I should do, I should be fired. I mean, like he was the perfect guy for that, like the perfect guy for that. And that's what was fun. It's fun when you get it. It's fun when you hit a home run because everyone feels it. You, you, you know, you, you hire the right director. You got a great script. And you guys, you got Jack and Tawny in town and like everyone's going out to dinner. It was just like, I mean, it was beyond fun feels good every once in a while to get a slam dunk like that something that i'm sure changes the mood is when you guys go on location especially in the winter in toronto yeah. um when you guys did the time travel episode were you surprised uh by how quickly people spotted paul wesley on the streets we were wondering like was paramount surprised that this was going to happen because it's like <laughs> a, he's walking around you know Toronto people are going to notice a that. major street corn like a big intersection in Toronto too well <laughs> god I could talk about Paul for so long I love Paul so much I mean can, I can't believe like the poor guy like the nerves you know like I mean stepping into those boots and luckily he had you know Ethan to talk to and Sally to talk to and and, and, and but um but then he had to play three versions of the character, like three timelines. Like, can we make it any harder for this guy? Like, not only do you have to come play Kirk, but you, you have to do it in three different versions. And like, they're like, and he nailed every one of them. And um, and it really feels like the fans are behind him, and they should be because he's such a fantastic guy, and he loves the role so much. Um, I've I've been able to direct a lot with him. Um, just randomly, you know, I, I actually directed the season one finale with him, but then there were some COVID issues in his other episodes. So I ended up getting to direct a lot of uh, his scenes in, uh, in, in other episodes. Um, so I've had the, the pleasure of working a lot with him. Um, I don't think anyone knew how big of a star he was. I mean, I didn't, uh, but I, I soon realized when, yeah, he was walking through uh, the center of Toronto and like there's 5,000, it's like the Beatles, you know, um, we just kind of rolled with it. I think he has something like 15 million Instagram followers or something like that. So yeah, they, we just rolled with it. I mean, we don't shoot on location very often. And, and, and the reason is we have this amazing technology called the, called the AR wall, uh, the volume. Uh, so uh, we were the, we are the first show ever to be designed to conceive from, from the ground up from day one to be built for AR. Now the Mandalorian definitely started using it uh, after they start after they kind of invented their show but but we launched this show uh, and and this is a testament to, to to Alex Kurtzman and Akiva and Henry um, you know Toronto has many amazing benefits it, I, I truly believe it's the best place to make cinema uh, as I said earlier but it's the worst place to shoot uh, it's got terrible locations terrible weather um, and it's not close to any other good locations or good weather. It, it, it you know, so it, it's a, it's a great place to do a big stage show, but it's a terrible place for a show called strange new worlds. Like how many times can we go to the same quarry and, and <laughs> call it a strange new world? Um, so we were really up against it because we didn't want to shoot anywhere else, but Toronto. So the show had to be designed very early on. You had to think of the show in one of two ways. One, this is a very light, nimble show that we're going to have some standing sets in Toronto, but we're going to be we're going to we're going to we're going to be able to fly to Morocco or fly to Iceland or fly like we're going to be light and nimble. And this we're going to design a show with this crazy schedule and crazy budget, and that's what we're going to show we're going to make. And look, some shows do shoot that way. You know, some of the Game of Thrones they 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 have a season, they block it, they have an Iceland team, and then they have a Morocco team. So there, there's ways to do that. But that wasn't going to work for us in some way. That wasn't going to work for our 10 directors and 10 episodes things. We didn't want a block shoot. And we didn't want our episodes to all look the same. We wanted 10 different movies. So we really 
we're at the forefront of of AR technology and 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 shooting on the volume, and we literally built this show for this technology. So our show 100% was going to succeed or fail on how we use this technology. And I say that now um, without shaking, but when we made this decision, I had no idea how this technology worked. And this was my job. This was my responsibility. I, I was the one in charge of it. And uh, I had, you know, I did what any, you know, top TV director would do. I just started watching all the behind the scenes of Mandalorian to see what I could I could learn. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was my, and, and, and luckily we have this amazing team, uh, uh, you know, Jason Zimmerman, our VFX producer is, is a genius and a genius at this. Um, same with our DP, Glenn Keenan. So we created this whole new department. It's called Virtual Art Department, VAD. And it's myself, um, Glenn Keenan, our DP, Benji Bakshi, our DP, um, Ian Anderson, our DP, uh, Jonathan Lee, our production designer, and uh, Jason Zimmerman, our visual effects producer. And we so we took all these people from, from production, someone from post, and we put them together and we started building these worlds uh, inside this volume, uh, in this AR technology. And very quickly for people who have no idea what I'm talking about is what we do on strange new worlds to create our worlds is we don't shoot on green screen. Generally, uh, occasionally we do, we, you know, there's, we still sometimes do old school VFX, but what we do is we build our worlds, not in post, not with green screen. We build them in prep four months before we ever start shooting like Kajitar for 201. We started building up four, over four months before day one of shooting. We build our worlds using Unreal Engine technology, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the software that runs video games. And we, instead of playing it back on the year, we, 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 we build these worlds polygon by polygon with our team of artists. Uh, again, it's our DPs, our production design, all these VFX, all these different departments building these 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 digital worlds together, and then we project these worlds on a giant sort of sound stage that looks like a horseshoe with a ceiling, and you and so instead of the actors coming to set and walking onto a green screen, they're walking into these worlds. These are real worlds. So two hundred eight, the Klingon battlefield, that's real. Uh, we we have animated. Klingon birds of prey flying overhead. You know, every episode, all the worlds that you're seeing, they're not built in post by, by VFX artists. They're built in prep by our DP, by our production designer, by our VFX producer, just a whole different way of thinking. So, you know, and, and there's so many benefits, not least of which the actors get to actually act in the world that they're that they're supposed to be in the setting they're supposed to be in. I would say that is the game changer for our show visually. Uh, what's made our show succeed uh, and look fantastic. It, it, and it was a, it was an all in or all out uh, choice. We went all in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say the big thing about season two, uh, the big thing about season two is we really learned the technology better and we really improved it. Um, and, 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 you know, I think now we're extremely confident with it, that what we do seasons three and, and beyond are going to be truly mind blowing. I mean, I, I've talked about a lot about this on the pod and I've actually been critical at times, especially at discovery, which was using it before you guys, where they were just like, oh, let's make a round set, you know, and it was so, it was, it was obvious they were just starting using this technology. And so. It was clear, like, oh, this is the AR wall. It's obvious it's the AR wall. Whereas, like, some people were blown away by Mandalorian saying, I can't believe that wasn't shot on location. And so I've seen you guys improve, and I'm curious where you could see this going. What are things you'd like to do in the AR wall set? Like, perhaps having the characters move around more, that kind of stuff, you know, or, you know, but what are, what are some of these things you can, you think you guys could now do for seasons three or four? Yeah, well, I, you're not limited with blocking, really, and you shouldn't feel that way. The stage is is fairly large. We're excited to do all sorts of things. We're excited to land shuttles on the wall. We're, we're excited to have more animation on the wall. We're excited to, you know, our engineering set, our 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 mess hall set. Those are Amort sets. So we're not just building worlds. We're building phenomenal 
scope and scale sets that would never be able to afford on any movie budget, let alone a TV budget. We're able to build those sets and we go back to them. We go back to engineering all the time. Um, so that's, we've realized the benefit of that. So for Star Trek in general, you know, sure, we're the beneficiary of this technology and, and we're, 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 we're learning it and we're going to pass it, not only pass on what we've learned to all the next Star Trek shows, but we're going to be able to pass on a library of these sets, you know? So right. this engineering, all these, every world that we've been to is now going to be available to any other Star Trek show. So, and it's, you know, these are, th- these would not be, <clears throat> be very cost prohibitive. Like, let's say you did, let's say you did have the money to go build a cash uh, you know, like the, the, the old way. You know, well, then that would have to be that the, the stage would be one of these gigantic stages in Ireland or something like that. And then you'd have to hold it in that stage for as many years as you wanted to keep it and constantly touch it up and paint it. You know, we build these digital worlds and then you, you save it and you download it and then you, you bring it back up when you use it. So if you think of Star Trek, if I had to say where is Star Trek going to be in 10 years from now, you're going to have a, a you're going to every Star Trek show and hopefully there's plenty of them. Um, is going to have a digital backlot. You're going to have a digital backlot if everything that Disco does, everything that we do, everything that you know, if if, uh, um, if Starfleet Academy goes, everything that they do. So you're going to have all these shows creating this big digital backlot of all these Star Trek worlds, and you're not stuck with them. You can tweak them and color them and change them and light them differently. So every, like they don't, they never look stale because you you can very easily update them. It really is beyond exciting. Uh, it, it is. It's the future of filmmaking, of, uh, of, of having these digital backlots. Um, I'm also very much a conservationist at heart, and long-distance shooting has a lot of problems. You know, you're flying an entire cast and crew. To, like, let's say you go shoot in Machu Picchu. You know, you're going to go fly an entire cast and crew there. You have to put everyone up in hotels. You get you trample the site. There's, you know, you... You, it, 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 you know, taking a film crew to sensitive, beautiful places is problematic and expensive. Um, and let's say you get there and then it's raining. Like, the, like on the wall, you have the perfect, you have magic hour, the perfect lighting for as long as you want it. It really is. I mean, it really is a filmmaker's dream come true. And, and especially from a director point of view to be involved in these worlds. So, you know, we, we, the, every guest director gets to light their own world and set there in the world. Like Jonathan Frakes gets there and he, oh, I want those mountains bigger, bring that mountain closer. Like you can't do that in a real occasion. And you definitely can't do that with old school VFX because that's happening four months after the director has gone. So you've taken the director out of the visual making profit process AR has taken the director, the production designer, the DP, and put them back in the forefront of world building. And that's why I think Star Trek Strange New Worlds, our worlds look so great. We have our best visual thinkers, our best visual artists making these worlds. And you're right. You know, some of them, some of them season one seemed a little stagey. We, we, We didn't know exactly what we were doing. I think we improved a lot season two. Uh, and we're going to improve a lot season three. And it's the technology is is moving faster than you could believe. And, you know, I, I know we were talking about AI earlier, and I think there's probably a, a, a very fair use of AI for AR. Um, right. I think there's a fair I think there might be a lot of um, benefit for using AI to help build these worlds, you know, or enhance these worlds and, and, and affect these worlds with the camera a little bit differently. Um, and I, I don't want to bore everyone with the technical side of things, but. There is a there is a depth of field issue uh, with with the walls that we haven't really been able to figure out technically, but we're hoping that maybe an AI algorithm might give us some benefit there. I don't know how much you can get into this, but I know that you know production was supposed to start way back in April, and you it couldn't obviously because of you know obvious reasons. But are these guys building season three already? You know, are you are you already seeing season three the virtual sets? So we, I think we were up to we were up to episode three hundred seven with AR. So um, we we had a uh, you know as I said we had a uh, you know a, um, a document uh, you know a, here's your ten genres here's your ten worlds um, and we were uh, we were we were into three hundred seven uh, when we shut down and we were doing some exciting stuff. We found a way now to use it uh, in almost every episode. And, and again, if it, and if it's not used in an episode, then 
then often like we, 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 that's a great episode to bring up engineering or bring up one of these, one of our, one of our AMORT standing sets who are, which are also AR. But yeah, so we, um, we, like I said, in our, in our discussion about how early we start, uh, we were almost done with season three AR, uh, by the time we shut down for the strike. But the, because the showrunners are on strike, even though none of the artists are on strike, they didn't continue working because there's no supervision essentially to yeah we, we, our showrunners are are everything so yeah as soon as those guys were off the off the ticket we uh we shut down so yeah i mean i i we shut down i stayed up in toronto for two weeks i was really optimistic i was like this is gonna blow over no but the, <laughs> this is <a> <laughs> I, I was so wrong. I, everything I thought was wrong, but we'll get right back on it. And um, look, I, you know, I mean, the show is the, the, the show is such a huge hit, not, not just ratings wise and not just review wise, but it really spiritual, spiritually. I think, I mean, I think the show really was the right show for the right time, you know, coming out of COVID, like the, it's optimistic, you know, it hits all of Roddenberry's, these truths that we've, we've, we've seen that have, lasted through track like it really was the right show at the right time um and it feels good making it and it, it you know again i, I just I, I i people you know everything i've heard from from the studio is, is they can't wait to get back on back on the the horse as well we just once the strike is over uh you know fingers crossed i don't think it's going to be long till we're back up and running we, we were I, I was directing the first episode. I was going to direct the premiere. I don't know if I still will anymore because once we come back, there's going to be a whole shuffle around probably. But I was ready. You know, I was I had storyboarded the pretty much the entire first episode. That's how close we were to starting shooting. We we're a day, one day away from flying the actors in, and that's kind of like <laughs> that's, Oof. that's we're like, do we fly the actors in, and then. You know, that's when it, it kind of went above my uh, above my pay scale. And uh, in, in hindsight, again, I, I thought it was going to blow over. I was like, you know, I'm a director. So I'm like, bring him in. Let's just shoot. Let's get something done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, I'm like the guy in the trenches, like the sun's going down and it's raining. You still have two scenes left. I'm like, let's just shoot. Like, you know, my idea is, you know, you shoot until it shoot until they tell you to stop. But luckily, there's uh, smarter people than me uh, making these decisions. And uh, they pulled the plug on us. What if like magic happened? The governor of California comes in and said, cuts a deal and all the strikes are over on Friday. How long would it take to get shit happening? Or or have you guys picked a date just to just to pick a date, you know, in the future anyway? Just to Well So kind of what we're doing right now, and this isn't official by any means. Myself and the producers up in Toronto, we keep kinda of like we'll kinda of say that okay, there's a date, like let's say let's say the end of this month. And what would happen? What would we need to do to then get going? And then once that, <clears throat> once the strike passes that, then we set it for the next month. We're, we're not that many weeks away from being able to start. Um, you know, absent all the other conflicts which may have risen by now. You know, who who knows <laughs> who, who knows what everyone's doing? You know, and uh, you know all these. You know, like do do you would you guys? Because I know that the Section Thirty One. I mean, they they've. If they could get going, they want to get going in the fall because they've got Michelle Yeoh and her schedule. Would that hurt you guys if that, you know, or are you guys on different stages? I don't think it would hurt us. You know, obviously Ola Tunde and, you know, that whole crew is, you know, that's our family. So we'd work it out. Like, that's a great thing about Trek. Like, we, this really isn't hyperbole or, or, or something like it really feels like a family. We just work it out. We worked it out with Disco season one, sharing the sharing the wall and sharing everything. And um, you know, you know, Tunde is uh, an incredible guy. And so, you know, a lot of that again, those kind of things that lot that's kind of also falls into what my job would be like. Hey, like, you know, this is what we, we here's the stages we want. Here's the stuff we want. How do we work this out and start figuring that out? Um, you, but, you used their sets for uh, two hundred one. We use those sets for a lot of things. You know, there's so many, we use those sets for all the time, which you, we repurpose it and reset them. I use it for uh, the um, the Romulan ship in uh, 110. That was also a disco set that oh, I really? repurposed. Yeah, yeah. They, there's like, we just, we share everything. We share, you know, T- Tunde was going up there to work and I was like, go stay at my place for free because I still had my place booked for, for the thing. So, you know, there's a lot of goodwill. It's not like, two separate shows that have to go figure out how to start on time. Cause you, I guess what you're saying is, aren't you guys sh- probably sharing a lot of 
crew and, and equipment and, and, and yeah. locations. Yeah, we, we are. But like those are people all in the family. So they'll come work for us. And they'll work it out. And hey, like, you know, they'll turn to us and say, hey, we have a really great DP, Glenn, and a really great AD, this guy Woody. And, and Tunde will say, I want Woody and Glenn for these two episodes. And then you can have them after that. I'm like, fine. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. So all that kind of stuff happens uh, uh, all under the, since we're all under the, you know, the secret hideout uh, umbrella. That's so Star Trek y of all of you. You know, it really is Star Trek y. There's not a lot of elbows <laughs> out. Um, and um, God, I'm so. Uh, so excited about section 31 and i really hope that i mean they're so close uh after so long they're so close um everything i've heard is that the the latest script is phenomenal i I haven't read the very latest one but um i don't see why if they strike end they said go i there's i mean again i don't I, i don't see any why why everything star trek could start up and start get going you know what i mean how long? I mean, realistically, you know, people on the show. I think uh, Alex once joked, "Well, you know, seven years—that's a good run for a Star Trek show." But do people, you know, the people on the show, how long do they see this show running realistically? I mean, I've never talked to my bosses about that, but I have an opinion. <laughs> I, I don't know why this show wouldn't go forever. I mean, I, I don't understand. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I honestly, why, why, like. Uh, you know, I don't know why it, there has to be an artificial shelf life. You know, um, I think I don't feel like you know as an, as amazing as our show showrunners have done. I I feel like I think everyone feels like we we just scratched the surface here. Like we haven't even begun to really push this boundary of, of genre. Like you know, I, you know, I think season one was great, and season two we improved and we got bigger and better and did all these great things. But like. There's so much more to do, um, and, and and you know, obviously, narratively, emotionally, we know where this show is going, <laughs> but how long it takes to get there, you know, uh, you know, is is anyone's guess? And um, you know, I mean, you know, my I I, I would like the show to go on, to, you know, I'd like to this to be show to be ten seasons. I'd also like to be making 20 episodes a season. You know, That's what I was going to ask you is, do you think it's realistic to think they'll ever expand the number of shows per season? I, you know, I have no idea. Nobody talks to me about that kind of stuff. That's where my, again, I, that's where my uh, executive producer uh, VIP card uh, doesn't work, you know? Um, but I don't know why not. I mean, we, uh, again, I, I made 22 episodes of person of interest for Jonah and JJ. And uh, we made 22 great episodes a season. Um, you know, but doesn't this show take roughly two weeks to shoot an episode? Yeah, so I'm not saying we do 22, but I think we could do 15. I don't know. I mean, what... Discovery when they started, they had more yeah. episodes. In a I mean, you, you you start getting into a log jam. You know, you it, the, the 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 hard thing is post in the writers' room. What you're kind of saying is like we're never taking a hiatus, right? Unless you take huge breaks. Right. I mean, I'm just a workhorse. You know, you're asking the you're asking the blue collar exec producer what he wants to do, and I, I like I, I'm, I'm like, put me in, coach. You know, I I, I want I just want to go hit some balls. Uh, you know, so I'll let the I'll let the big brain bugs worry about the the how to how to how to finish the scripts and stuff like that. Yeah, I just love doing it. I mean, it, I I love this cast. Um, and I look, I think that's the other thing to mention, which is so clear after season two and what, like what, 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 how did we improve the show? Or what changed season two? I think we figured out that our ensemble cast, every single one of them is a star and, yeah. and you know, you on captain driven Trek shows, which, you know, you know, maybe DS nine, there's a difference a little bit, but you know, you, you like, we realized that every single, like, and we knew Anson is a star. I mean, Anson is, you know, there, there's there, you know, there is no, other person than Captain. There's no Captain Pike or the Anson, but but I think we realized every one of our ensemble characters could be their own spinoff. I mean, they're that good. They're that good, and, and we're talking about like people who are relatively unknown. Like we knew Rebecca was awesome, and we knew Ethan was awesome because season two of Disco, right? Um, and, and you know, but like, I mean, Chrissy and Babs and and Jess and Celia and and you know, even like you know. Melanie, who's come on for for I mean, like the, the the supporting cast is so incredible. Melissa, uh, they're just amazing. So I I think you know when you start looking at the the show, like you know certainly I think it could go on 
for many seasons, and, and and certainly there's opportunities for spinoffs. But who knows? Maybe they go make TOS next again, which which you know there's a, there's some excitement there. But I I really like this world. I really like the this prequel world is really fun to direct in. I'm sure it's really fun to write into. I have to let the show run. It's really fun to direct Spock before we know Spock. It's really fun to direct Uhura before you know Uhura. And it's fun to see them make mistakes. And uh, like, cause like, you know, no one's a straight line. Right. And we all have these ups and downs and these struggles. And, you know, I know it was fun, fun watching some of the fans get mad about human Spock this year, but like as a director, like the more that the better, because like, you know, that's, of course he was young and did things like, like, I don't know. It's just, it's really uh, the, the creative energy and excitement and pleasure and joy of doing the show, doing this prequel to the, and to, to tell the story of these characters that are so beloved in this early state is, is really beyond anything I've ever experienced as a director. And, uh, and, and if anyone asked me for my vote, I, I'd say more is more. I'm loving the characters. Like I'm right there with you. We're very invested in them. And I'm just wondering, there's a history in Star Trek of the older shows before this new era where the cast would want to change a line of dialogue, a moment, how they reacted to something on set. And it was a whole, you had to make a phone call. It took 20 minutes to track down the writer to get permission for the slightest syllable. And I'm wondering how, much i assume it's not that atmosphere and i'm just wondering how much input they have since they're really getting to know their own character so well too like is that a more collaborative environment yeah but i'd also say there's a lot of respect for the script but there is no uh rigid process or there's none of none of none of that stuff and i know that world i mean two of my big mentors um were mary howard who uh, oh, uh, yeah. was a producer who's a, and then and then probably as a uh, a uh, man who's like a second father to me is this guy Marvin Rush, who oh. uh, yeah was a DP on I think 250 episodes of Trek. Yeah, and Marvin Marvin really taught me filmmaking, and Mary taught me how to be a producer. Um, so I know I know all the stories of of Trek production back in the day and and, and how challenging. Um, and look, I mean, you can imagine a person in my show would say that would wouldn't spill any dirt, but I actually would spill dirt if I knew it. None of that stuff happens. Like it really is. They respect the script. They love the script. When a line doesn't work, they change it to make it work. And everyone knows it was done for the right reasons. You know, we don't, you know, people don't, you know, there's no, um, it's super collaborative. Um, You know, part of what, part of the strange thing about the, the writer strike is that everything that the writers are asking for already happens on our show. So there's always a writer on set and, and, and myself and the directors are the most fortunate people to have those writers on set. Um, and the actors love it. And like, we're all there together. There's no sidebars. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, Hey, I don't like the script. I'm not going to tell anyone. And if we don't like this, we, we read the script out loud in rehearsal and we, and if we don't like it, we, we, we make it work, but 99% of the time, the script's banana's good. So, you know, we just keep doing different versions of it and try things. And yeah, no, no there's no red phone to the, to the <laughs> office where there's the nuclear button, you know, uh, that that's not on our show. The showrunners, the big brains, as you were just saying, recently talked about season three as if it's just going to be. I forget the phrase that Kiwi used was season two on steroids or something like that. So, yeah. but more big swigs, more genres. So now you're looking at a new board of 10 episodes, 10 new worlds. And like last season you had crossover and musical. Like, are you looking at any words up there that are just like scaring the shit out of you? Like, Oh my God. <laughs> Every one of the words up there scares the shit out. Of me. I mean, <laughs> the show is, the show is terrifying to make and to know that my boss is, you know, an Oscar winning writer. And my first job directing was directing his script. I mean, I'm terrified, but that's the best thing about the job. If it wasn't exciting like that, you weren't challenged like that, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be what it is, but um, yeah, they're big swings. They're definitely big swings. And I, my guess is that they're all going to stick, but the AR wall and scripts are an immovable object and an unstoppable force. So you do not want those things to collide. You want those things to run parallel right? Because you cannot move the AR wall, the dates. It's, it's like, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a Goliath. Um, so, so what we try to do is we try to line up scripts in the AR wall to go side by side. Um, that, that said, we're never totally successful. And we always 
run out of something and we're always juggling. And um, so we, we were, we were ahead on AR sets. We were further ahead on AR sets than we were on scripts. So in this three, four months, 10 years, however long it takes for (laughs) the studios to get their uh, brains back, you know, who knows, maybe maybe they've rethought, maybe they'll rethink some of the, I'm I'm sure they've been thinking about these scripts, even though they haven't been writing them. But yeah, you know, obviously I can't say anything about season three, but uh, yeah, what I see up on the wall scares the heck out of me. So season two was mostly written and produced before season one even aired. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't get a chance to get the fan reaction before you were working on that. So has the reaction since then affected season three? Because now you have had some time. Look, you can you can imagine a a response to season one where my answer would be totally different. Uh, If it didn't work. Yeah. You know, but no, I mean, because it, we loved making it, we thought they were amazing. We thought they were going to be big hits, and then they were. So, so it didn't affect season two, and it won't affect season three. <laughs> I, I rem, you know, it was so vivid, and I'm sure you, if you guys, I'm sure the fans, everyone's heard this a million times because it's it's kind of kind of folklore by now. Uh, it, you know, the pitch, you know, generally. So when I get my job, when I'm the producing director, I generally go and <clears throat> meet with the showrunners, and you know it can get very detailed and elaborate and, you know, you're talking, you know, uh, what daytime lighting, what nighttime lighting, like all oh, you're very detailed. Like, like literally the pitch for the show was, and this is from Akiva and Henry is like, Hey guys, let's just, let's just go make Trek. Let's, let's just make Trek. Like that's what we, like, so, I'm, and, and like, you know, so I'm like waiting, like, and it, it took me a second. I'm like, that's it. Like, this is a five second meeting. Uh, that's, uh, but, but I was, <laughs> but I was, I had never had a clearer directive ever because I knew what they meant. I knew what they knew exactly what they meant. Like, let's just go make track. Let's, let's not, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's go make track and let's, like, let's, you know, and of course, let's use everything we have at our disposal from AR to, you know, these incredible, beautiful Cook special prime lenses, like, you know, to, to make it cinema, but, but we were making track. So that's what we did season one. And again, and, the, and it, and it felt like it was working. You know, I've certainly been on shows that haven't been hits. Um, I, I'm lucky to have been, you know, this is my fourth kind of hit show in a row. I did warehouse 13. Then I did person of interest and magician. So this, I've been nice to be on a little bit of a runner here, thankfully to uh, the phenomenal showrunners and writers that I've been working for. But I knew, I guess I, I didn't know. I mean, I could tell that the show was awesome. Uh, you know, it just, it was, it was just too much fun to make. It's like, well, how would this not work? Like, you know, and, and look, I mean, thank you so much to disco, like season two of disco. We knew it worked, right? Yeah. You saw that chemistry. You like, and, and not, not, and not that those characters are in the same place, but like you knew Anson Mount was Captain Pike, you know, and everything else is kind of gravy. Right. And then the gravy was amazing because all these, like I said, all these ensemble cast members were so amazing, but, um, you know, Akiva and Henry would have to answer the part about the writer's room, but we made zero adjustments um, creatively uh, for production, you know, camera, lighting. Uh, and then we just, you know, we, you know, we're perfectionists and, and, and we wanted to improve and do everything better. But we, we there was no like learning lesson taken from season one that we're like, OK, we, you know, you know, the fans really didn't like this or their fans, like everyone's bumming out on this. We, like, there was none of those, um, none of those uh, conversations that happened. You guys are really leaning into the AR wall, which is obviously very digital, but you're also leaning heavily into the work done by practical guys um, like Legacy. Like someone had to decide when we do the Gorn, someone could have easily said, let's just do it digitally. Especially with the air wall, you know, like you guys are big into digital, but you guys said, no, let's not do it. Like, was that a difficult decision? And is this kind of, you know, can we expect more? Because, you know, I love old fashioned practical effects, you know, but uh, it's it's not always what people choose these days. Look, I, I don't want to sound too egotistical to so say that we we do all these things differently in a unique way, but we, we also, ha- we, like we, we do, we, we deal, we deal with this very differently and very uniquely. We've said over and over that we're going to make the best creatures and the best creatures are going to be both practical and visual effects. And we need every one of us working together. So we don't just concept with legacy. We don't just concept with our VFX team. 
both of those guys are working together day one. They're concepting together. They don't usually work together. I don't think they usually work. I don't think they work together on any other shows, you know, and there's not without some sort of, you know, team building that needs to happen to get that to work, you know, because you have a, a an art form, which is considered by some people to be outdated and then an art form, which is, you know, they're, they're, but like, I couldn't disagree more. You need both. You, you need, you need claws to grab and crawl into you need a face to push up it's like you need we need real creatures we're again we're a character driven show it's not like you can't see something at 50 feet you, you have to interact with it um but you know i truly believe the best art comes from uh using all the best artists and working in collaboration to make it happen so <clears throat> we have you know, uh alan's team at legacy and J- jay-z's team uh on the vfx uh they worked hand in hand on every shot of the Gorn. And I will say that I think 90% of the shots of the Gorn, at least 90% are both prosthetic and VFX. Cause we, they, we, we were like, Hey, why would we spend an hour of shoot time on a set trying to get this thing to blink the right way? A right. blink could be done by VFX, but the eyeball, we want to see that thing. We want to see it. We want to see it glisten. We want to put goop on it. We want to be able to touch it. We want to see the reflections of the room on it. That eyeball needs to be prosthetic, you know? Um, so we had like the, the Gorn fight, the zero G Gorn fight. The entire fight was done with a, with a Gorn in the suit, a prosthetic, prosthetic thing. You know, it was it, incredibly difficult. Maya Vavrilo, our director, did an incredible job. That whole thing could have aired <clears throat> practically. But VFX ended up touching almost every shot. Why? And, and you said, that, well, what well, VFX was going to touch every shot, why didn't you just have VFX do the whole thing to begin with? Because it doesn't look good. You need both and you need both working together. So, you know, and I think maybe some of the, the initial interest in, um, you know, now we know it works. So, so, so we'll do everything we can to, to keep, to keep legacy uh, as, as a, as a core partner in the show. But I think maybe to begin with, maybe there was some thought that oh we you know we don't you know we don't need to do this. But but because because of the TOS connection, uh, I, I think there was at least a sort of an interest in trying to do do a little bit with things a little bit more old school. Uh, and we've just found a real sweet spot and a great way in how to do it. I think I mean, Lori, do you have anything else? I just I, mean, I think I we've taken up your whole day. more questions, but I feel like we gotta we gotta call it. <laughs> I mean, we'd love to have you back to to talk more because I feel like we we on our own list we still have a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm thinking of new things. As to, every time you say something, I'm thinking of new things that I want to ask you about. So, well, I I would love to come back, and I, I'd love to get some of our directors on too. Like we really have ph- phenomenal directors and phenomenal people, and um, I I feel like it truly is like a dream team, and we get the the, the best the best directors in town. So. Um, such a creative atmosphere it is yeah it's great it is until someone screws it all up but they haven't done it yet i'm sure like i mean knock on wood but uh yeah we haven't had a uh, we haven't had a slow slow dog in the race yet well you know it's been more than a pleasure it's been fun and enlightening yeah thank you, you so much thank you guys so much that's really fun and uh thanks again for all your work and for supporting the show Well, that was great. Thank you for sticking through it, even though it was quite long. I found it fascinating. I love the nuts and bolts and getting into the weeds. Me too. I could have talked to him for hours more, and we definitely will get him back because he just, it's hard not to feel enthusiastic about the show, listening to him talk about the process of creating it. So we are now two weeks away from the season four premiere of Lower Decks. So in two weeks, we'll have a podcast covering the first two episodes because they're going to release two on the same day. Next week, between now and then, we're going to do uh, we're going to catch up on all the news from August that we haven't been talking about on the pod. And uh, we'll do a little bit of a preview of what to expect from season four of Lower Decks. So we will see you folks next week.